Foster Ridge. Good morning. It's good to see y'all. Um, we actually have the technology now where I can be in A first hour. I was in A first hour last hour, first time in a year and a half. And uh, all those people that have been sleeping through my sermons had to wake up uh, last hour. And the, the other cool thing is now we can actually stream this sermon live to D. They're not watching the video from last hour. They're watching this as you're listening to me live. So I want to say good morning to Building D as well. And we're just glad all of you are here. A few times when I preach a message, I will give some disclaimers before the message. And I have a couple of disclaimers for this message. Um, we are in an 18-week series on Ephesians. Well, that's what we like to do here. We like to take a book and go through it verse by verse. And this is about week 11. So if, if you, after this message or during this message, feel like I'm preaching this message just because you came or a friend of yours came, you need to know that this is already planned out. Is that a fair disclaimer? Because I had a bunch of people at the first hour saying, did my wife email you this week? <laughs> did my husband email you this week? This is one of those sermons that um, it's very easy to listen to. It's very hard to apply. There is nothing in the Greek text and what we're going to look at today that is difficult to interpret. There is nothing difficult about this message to preach. It is a very hard message to apply. This is one of those messages that you will quickly think of other people that need to apply it. And you'll think that you don't need to. And there is something in this message for each of you. I have struggled myself personally through this message all week, making sure my heart is right to give it to you. And I am tired of messing with it, so I'm going to lay it on you. <laughs> Let's turn to Ephesians. We're going to read the whole text, and then we're going to walk through it together. Ephesians 5. I'm sorry, Ephesians 4. I'm going to start in verse 25. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Therefore... Having put away falsehood, let each one of us speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down to your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only as such as good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. We've been learning in Ephesians that sin separates you from God, and sin separates you from each other. And Jesus fixed all that and he started this movement called the church and this dynamic group of people that he has planted on this globe to represent Jesus back to the world called church. And we've seen through history that the church oftentimes botches that. But Jesus has come to fix that so we'll do that with spirit-filled, spirit-controlled living. But this text right here, when we don't apply this text, all of that gets messed up. This text right here, when not applied, affects marriages, affects homes, and breaks up churches. So Paul's going to deal with some stuff that can wreck our lives. And as I start this message, I know that in a room this large, in a room as large as D, some of you are sitting in this room and in D, and you are hurt. There are things that have hurt you. It may have been two weeks ago. It may have been 20 years ago. For some of you, it happened 20 years ago and you still feel like it happened yesterday. Maybe it was a church that hurt you. There is no worse hurt that I have to counsel through than a pastor or a church that hurt someone. And some of you are sitting in this room, and you may not describe it as hurt. Maybe you describe it as, I am bitter. Maybe you wouldn't use the word bitter. Maybe you use the word frustrated or angry. But you're bitter. And here's what bitterness causes. Bitterness takes a videotape of the time, the time you were hurt, excuse me, who hurt you, what they said, where you were, how they said it, and bitter people play the video over and over and over. And you just replay it. And every time you replay that video, it feels like you're getting hurt all over again. And you remember details about that day. It could have been 10 years ago. And you remember where you sat, what they wore, what they looked like, what they said, what way you were facing at the table. I mean, you guys can't remember what time our services start. But you remember in earnest details about that conversation, don't you? 
or that situation or those circumstances that hurt you because you play that videotape over and over and over. Some of you are hurt this morning. Some of you are bitter. James talks about uh, jealousy and envy and selfish ambition. Most of you would not say you're a jealous person or you're envious, but some of you are envious of other people. Another biblical word to use is you covet other people. You, you covet what they have. You may covet their house. I wish I had that house. I wish that house would be taken away from them. I wish I had his wife. She's really prettier. She's prettier than my wife. I wish I had that husband. He seems so outgoing and so tender and so adventurous in the way he just speaks to his kids. Don't you realize you always see the best of everybody else, but you never see the worst? But you covet because you think if I could have their life. Some of you may covet someone's health or their youthfulness. Some of us struggle with coveting. And a lot of these things are, are hit on in the, in the well, what I call the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. And you read some of these, you think like, we're going to hit verse 28. Some of you think verse 28 doesn't apply. I can just check out because that's about stealing and I don't steal. I believe verse 28 is the most convicting verse in this text and I'll get to it. But we struggle with these things. You know, jealousy is the first sin that was ever committed by Lucifer. Lucifer was created by God himself. And, and I'll call him this. He was the lead worship leader. He was the lead pastor of worship. His job was to reflect the glory of God back to God. And Lucifer became jealous of God. I don't want to just worship God. I want to be God. And it's interesting that the first sin is the one that I believe he uses over and over and over. Bitterness, anger, and jealousy. Some of you think that Satan works in big ways like nations and, and Hitler and Stalin and, 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 and presidents that I didn't vote for. But I'm telling you, we start talking about bitterness and anger and lack of forgiveness. Satan doesn't have to do big things. He just works in those little home run areas because it's so subtle and it just sucks us in. And we can nurse a hurt for so long. And what it does is it takes you out spiritually. People won't serve in church because they're hurting. People won't give to someone else because they're hurting. People won't forgive because they're hurting. And it can just suck you right in. Usually bitterness is not so much about the magnitude of the sin, but the proximity of the offender. You see, strangers usually don't disappoint us. Strangers usually don't hurt us. It's those closest to us. It's those we respect. It's those that we care about. It's moms and dads and daughters and sons and best friends and roommates and pastors. And that's why this stuff hurts so much. Sadly, it even extends to God, doesn't it? You ever been bitter at God? Angry toward God. I've been angry toward God. I've been bitter toward God. And the thing about God is this. When you think about God, he's like a gazillion, billion, and zero. He's never lost. I'm not going to win that one. But I can start to think that because of what God has done or what God hasn't done, therefore I now have to be bitter and angry and hurt. There's a woman in our Bible I, was, I thought about this week preparing this message, Naomi, in the book of Ruth, one of my favorite books in the Bible. And Naomi lost all of the males in her family. And Naomi, the, the word in Hebrew literally means sweet. And she says, I will now change my name to Mara, which means bitter. And this is what Naomi says. She says, God has made me bitter. Naomi was wrong. And if you think that of yourself, you're also wrong. Bitterness is your responsibility. You see, Luke 6 says it like this, that inside of a righteous man, what comes out of the heart are righteous things. Inside of a wicked man, what comes out of the heart are wicked things. No one makes you bitter. Bitterness comes out because it's already in your heart. What is already in your heart? Anger, bitterness, slander. Those things are in there. Those circumstances just express to you and everyone around you what is already true about who you are. That stuff is in there. So we've got to not justify ourselves. Someone has made me bitter. You are responsible for your bitterness. You are responsible for your anger. Now, you cannot be responsible for pain. But you can be responsible for how you react and respond in the midst of that pain. You and I are responsible for that. 
I'm going to follow my notes closer today than I normally do because this will be one of those sermons that someone will say, Brad said blank, and it won't be what I said. So I'm going to follow it a little closer. And if you want, I can email the manuscript to you. (laughs) Here's another way of saying what I'm talking about. You're not ever going to go through life without getting bumped. If you live on planet Earth, people are going to hurt you. Now, here's what some of us do. We try to... We try to live life without getting bumped, so we just disengage. We disengage from people getting close. We disengage from sharing our feelings with people. We disengage from sharing our sin struggles. We just kind of pull back. We're not going to be held accountable. But if you live on planet Earth, whether you're engaged or disengaged, you're going to get bumped. You're going to get hurt. This text today, this sermon today is about what comes out of you when you get bumped. Today we're discussing the rottenness It comes out when we get bumped. So let's dive into, look at verse 25 again. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. If jealousy is the first sin, lying has to be the second sin. And the way lying was the second sin, the way Lucifer committed the sin with Adam and Eve, it wasn't so much what we would call a lie, although it is, It's what we would culturally call not telling the full truth. He looked at Adam and Eve and said, did God really say? So he questions God's character. And then he does affirm some things that God says, but he doesn't affirm everything that God says. I believe that we struggle with lying. You may think, I don't lie. You you realize that lying is like one of the easiest sins you'll ever commit. That's why our kids, one of the first big sins that breaks our heart as a parent is lying. When your child first lies to you, it just crushes your heart, doesn't it, mamas? Because you're, th- you're sitting there thinking, first of all, my child is more spiritual than any other child. And you realize they're not. They're rotten inside just like I am, just like their daddy is. <laughs> Especially him. <laughs> and then they lie and they deceive you and they'll say A when it's B and your heart hurts. We learn to lie at a young age. We learn to lie to self-protect our own reality. We use lying, I want you to get this, we use lying to create our own reality and protect ourselves in it. A couple of weeks ago, someone called me, and we use technology to lie, call our ID. <laughs> someone called me, and I looked at it, and I did not want to talk to them. They are a very annoying person. They, they're not in here right now. They come first hour. <laughs> <laughs> very annoying person. And I hit End. And then I saw them a few days later, and they said, oh, I called you. Did you get my call? And I said, I didn't get your call. Did you call me? I lied. Your pastor lied because I can use lying just like you can to control my own reality and protect myself in it. We can even use technology for it. And the truth is, I just didn't want to interact with them. Someone says, hey, do you have time? I got something I want to talk about. You know, I really don't. I'm busy. You have time. See, we can lie to self-protect our own reality. You see, lying is not just telling the bold-faced 180-degree lie. It's half-truths. It's not the full truth. It's what we would call white lies. The Bible calls it lying. The Bible also says liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. Lying is a grievous offense because the character of who God is is truth. And when you and I lie and bend the truth, it goes cross-grain with the character of of who God is. If he is our father, then we are his kids and we have to live like the father. Lying's a big deal. So Paul says, put aside lying. Ananias and Sapphira, remember them in your Bible? They lied. God took them out. Can you imagine if God still reacted to us when we lie or don't tell the full truth the way he did Ananias and Sapphira? Where would I be if God handled me that way? Well, last week I'd have been taken out. And you know what? If I hadn't been taken out, I'd be preaching to an empty room this morning. He says, put aside, put away falsehood. Let each one of you speak the truth of his neighbor, for we are members of one body. Tax time's coming. Boy, that popped a lot of heads up. (laughs) Some of you are going to lie on your taxes, and you're going to justify it in your own heart, saying, I give too much money already to the government. I don't like what the government does with my money. And you're going to justify someone else's conduct and decides your sin in the light of it and feel okay about it. Some of you students, are you cheating in school? When I was in college a long time ago, 
They had files in the sorority and fraternity houses. And they had every test. They had copies of tests. They had teachers and what they do. They had answers to tests. And I remember having people tell me, if you don't use it, you're going to fall behind because everyone else is using it. And I had to decide, am I more concerned about falling behind you or more concerned about lagging behind the spirit of my own heart? Am I willing to take a C and not cheat as opposed to take an A and cheat because everyone is, quote, doing it? It says, put away falsehood. And honestly, we're not honest about our bitterness toward others, are we? We're dishonest. We lie about our anger. How you doing? Fine. No, really, how you doing? Fine. I'm not perfect like you. Good to know. And there's stuff in our heart, isn't there? Is there someone, anyone, that if they walked in here right now, you just want to slink down in your chair and hope not to make eye contact and hope you can get out of here another way? We're dishonest about our own bitterness. We're dishonest about our own forgiveness issues. We avoid each other. Let's move on. That's not even the convicting verse. <laughs> verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Is it a sin to be angry? You see, I believe in church life, we have made it almost a sign of maturity if someone is never angry. I've heard people say this in counseling. He walks with God. I've never seen that man angry. I believe not ever being angry can be sin. Let me ask it this way. Did Jesus ever sin when he was here in the flesh? No. Did Jesus ever get angry? Yes. Is it possible to be angry and not be sinful? Yes. Jesus walks into his temple, his father's house, the place of worship, and these religious people had turned it around to get a prophet off the people who were there to worship God. And he was angry. He flipped tables over. That anger took a physical expression. Some of you, there are some things that should be making you angry, and it's not, and I think it's sin that it doesn't make you more angry. I think abortion in this country should make you angry. A couple of weeks ago, I was in India, and I was studying about the sex traffic in India, and I was getting angry. The anger in my heart, they, the, these people leave a place like Delhi, and they'll go to Afghanistan that's war-torn, and, and these, these girls are orphans. They don't have a home. They'll take six, seven, eight-year-old girls, take them back to Delhi, turn them into prostitutes. And these girls, most of them kill themselves before they turn 15. And I was angry. And I looked at Don Ellsworth. He was with me. And I, and I said, Don, we have to do something about this. I am angry. We have to do something. There is a righteous indignation that is very biblical and true in response. When God's ways or his words are being maligned and that you have the opportunity to make a difference in that and it can be sin when you are not bothered by the things that you should be bothered by let me give you a, a real life example enough little girls and little boys have been killed by drunk driving that there's a group of women called mad who got organized now you may look at that and say that's just a bunch of old women who are mad no those are women who have lost their children over a righteous indignation done and there can be great things that happen in a very positive way because we are angry about something but here's the catch do not let the, the sun it's not an angry to be uh, it's not a sin to be angry but he says in your anger do not sin you see here's what we have the propensity to do I am hurt I am wounded and therefore I feel anger and because I can justify my anger I feel justified in my sin in that anger the sin is not the anger. The sin is how you handle the anger in that situation. We justify like this. I've had people tell me this in the counseling office. I came home. I found that my wife was cheating on me. So what I did is I went and I cheated on someone to get her back. You see, all you have there, and now you have two broken people and more damage. Your sin is never justified because of your anger. Your, your anger may be justified. Someone comes home and finds out their spouse machine. Is that anger justified? You betcha. Now, what they do with that anger is a biblical issue. Look at the verse again, verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down to your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Don't you think it's odd that he put the word devil in there? He doesn't do that with these other words. He says there's something about anger that if you let it become sin in your life, it is demonic. 
You have two options when you've been hurt and wounded and you're bitter. You can forgive and you can be like Jesus or you can hold a grudge and be angry and be like Satan. You're going to go one of two paths every time, church. You can be like Jesus and you can be tenderhearted or you can be like Satan and you can sit there and play the tape over and over and over and he has put you in his little subtle trap. I am someone that kind of lets things go that bother me. I, I get over things. Some of you don't. And you play that tape over and over and over. The anger is justifiable. The sin is not. Matter of fact, you get angry, ask this, is this anger spirit-led? Has God's ways or his words been maligned? And is my response spirit-filled? He says, you will give the devil a foothold. Any rock climbers in here? You've got to have a foothold before you can advance to the next place in your climbing. What anger does is it will spiritually shut you down from advancing in your growth. It will shut everyone down around you because anger is a cancer. Men, I think the biggest struggle you and I have as men is anger. And don't let the kind guys fool you. They get angry too. They just hide it better. They're smarter than we are. Anger. I can't tell you how many times I have women come. My, my husband's just so angry. I think some of that is expectations we had in life that God didn't meet, so we're angry. We feel justified in it because we got a bad lot in life. And we're just like Mara. I'm bitter, and God made me bitter. But Paul's point is this. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. You need to deal with it. Don't let days and weeks and months and years where you just sit and play the tape over and you don't do anything with it. Now, I, I've always heard in marriage counseling, don't go to bed angry, and Christians always talk about that. I don't totally agree with that. I think there are right times to go to bed angry. Here's what I mean. There are times my wife and I, it's late, and we've been angry. She did something wrong. And there have been times in our anger and in our argument, we said, you know what? It is 11 o'clock. It is midnight, and we're going to say dumb, bad, mean things. We need to go to bed, and let's talk in the morning. And that was the better move for us at that moment. But that's not Paul's point. Paul's point is don't let days and weeks and months and years pass. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Now, here's, let, me, let me explain some reasons why we do let anger, the sun go down our anger. Because we justify our anger, we justify our hurt, we justify our, 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 our bitterness. The thought is, I'll just ignore it, some will say. And let a lot of time pass because time will just take it away like it never happened. Does that ever work? Because all that happens is as more time passes when you see them, it's more awkward and more strange and more tension-filled. And I'll, in every bitter situation, there's someone who always is the victim, and that's always you in that situation, and always a transgressor, that's always the other person. And the sun has gone down many days in that situation. And so what you have decided is, as you've played the tape, that the sin has become larger than where it started, and your innocent has grown with it. As time passes, we forget what we played in the part, we forget what led to the conversation, but what they did becomes a four, and then a six, and then an eight, and then they were screaming at me. By the way, guys, that's why email is horrible with conflict resolution. You can't translate font size. That's 18-inch uh, bold underline. She's really yelling. And then we just sit with it. We justify it. Well, they won't listen. I've heard that word. He won't listen. He's not, we'll use the word teachable because he's wrong and I'm right, right? And then the question always needs to come, are you teachable? Whenever I'm in a situation, and by the way, when I came to Westlake Bible Church back in 04, it was called Westlake Bible Church then, I said, you know what, I'm going to come and I'm not going to offend anybody and I'm not going to upset anybody, I'm going to do it as long as I can. It lasted 36 hours. <laughs> 36 hours I was here, there's a one in my office who's mad at me. And I was sitting there thinking, first of all, I, I haven't been here long enough for you to be mad at me yet. But, but anytime those situations when you start talking, someone has been hurt by something. They're hurt. It may come out to you as anger. It may come out to you as you did something. It may be anger towards you. They're hurt. And if you can get to the hurt and deal with the hurt, but some of us love to 
fester our hurts, don't we? Because we think if we remain hurt, then we're still in control. We can leave you in your silence. Every time I talk to a situation that's bitter, someone has tension and awkwardness, and someone has no clue that that was even happening. And we let the time pass. Some of you have justified it like this. I just don't like conflict. I'm not a conflict person that deals with conflict. Well, welcome to planet Earth. I don't know of anyone who says, I love conflict. Pastor, can you give me some tough situations? I'll just dive right in. They say, I just don't like conflict. A better person doesn't like conflict because they may have to actually say, you know what, I was wrong. Or I misunderstood this. I misperceived this. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. This stuff weighs on you. You sleep differently when you're not right with your spouse. There's physical things that happen to us when we're angry, when we're bitter. You know, our heartbeat starts racing. There's more stress in our life. I know when I'm angry. Here's what happens. My, beats, my heart starts beating really fast, and I start getting really hot. And, and I just feel like I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like, i got to open a window. I'm hot. And there's been times I lay in the bed at night with my wife. She has no clue I was upset, and I just feel that heart beating. And I've got a decision to make. Am I going to talk to her? Am I going to deal with it? Or is it something I need to deal with me and God? The, the body was never meant physically to handle bitterness and anger. That's why your body is your body's way of saying this is not right. You're, 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 you're made to be tender and kind-hearted and forgiving. And yet we get stressed with these things. I always hear people say, well, I'm stressed out. Why are you stressed out? Well, finances, job, work, marriage. They never say because I think I'm a really angry person. Or I think I'm really bitter and I'm just not dealing with it. I keep playing the tape over and over and that's causing my stress. No one ever puts that together. Let me say this. Vengeance, revenge is never your job. Your job is to forgive. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. When you forgive, there's now one free person in that situation. You. The Bible also says, Jesus, although being reviled and did not revile in return, being cursed, uttered no threats, but he entrusted himself to the will of the Father. Another way of saying that is this. There's only one person that even has the right to ever be bitter, and that's Jesus. Jesus has a good argument to be bitter, doesn't he? I mean, his Father creates this incredible world, creates people, puts us in there, gives us every blessing, gives us his presence, and then we sin and rebel against him. He sends his prophets to tell him, this is the way, walk in it and I'll bless you. And the storehouses of heaven will be open and we kill the prophets. He sends his only son in flesh who left the treasures of heaven and came down in the form of a man. And we beat him, we cursed him, and we killed him. If anyone ever has a right to be bitter and not forgive us, Jesus. Aren't you glad Jesus isn't mooting and unforgiving like you are? I mean, every religion in the world is built on a God that's moody. When you die, you hope you catch him in a good mood. Jesus is like that. He takes his enemies and he makes them his children. And we, his kids, act like the Father. You know, sometimes it's not even what you say, it's who you say it to. What we tend to do is we're bitter people, angry people. We won't go to the person to deal with it. We'll, we'll talk to other people. And we call it prayer request, don't we? I mean, how many times have you been in a life group or a small group and someone starts talking about someone, so-and-so did such-and-such and we just need to pray for them? Here's what I've learned. If you're an unforgiving or bitter person, you can't at the same time not be a legalist. Because if you're bitter and you're unforgiving, what you have to do to get to that point is, I am better, they are worse. Which means you're a Pharisee. I am right, they are wrong. You can't be partnering in the gospel and be unforgiving. I, if I had one sentence to say in church, it would be that. You can't partner in the gospel and not be willing to forgive someone who's hurt you. You don't understand the gospel. While we were yet still enemies, Christ did what? Died for us. How could we not forgive? Pastor, you don't know what they did. I don't know what they did. But I assure you that your heart has hurt others as well. I assure you that your words has done damage as well. I assure you that your actions or inactions 
has caused others to be bitter as well because you're not perfect. And so what we want is we want for others what we really want for ourselves. You know, we really want compassion for ourselves. It was an accident. I didn't mean what I said. I was frustrated. I was tired. It caught me at a bad time. I had some, you don't realize what's going on in my life. But we want judgment for everybody else that hurts us, don't we? It's the way athletes ask for forgiveness. Now, celebrities, they say something. It goes out on Twitter. And then a day later, they come up because their PR person told them to do it. They ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry I didn't mean what I said. No, you meant what you said. You still think what you said, but you have to say that to keep good PR. What is in your heart really comes expressed when you get bumped. Let's get to the convicting verse. Those are the easy ones. Verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You may be thinking, I really don't have a big deal problem with this. Do we steal? I want to say this. Everyone in this room is a thief. Like I said, tax time's coming up. You, some of you are going to steal from the government. Well, they stole from me. You cannot justify your sin with the actions of anybody else. Your job as a believer is to respond to God and he's your standard not to react to done, things done wrong by someone else in your life. Have a buddy ever uh, punch out for you later so you can leave work early a few minutes? You ever not give your best to your boss, and yet when it comes time for evaluation, you say, I work the hardest I can for you? You're stealing. See, we don't see it that way, do we? You ever not honor God fully? You see, he bought you, he redeemed you, he owns you. We steal from God all the time. You ever have your priorities in front of God's priorities? We steal. You go to the book of Malachi in your Bible, you have to turn there, but Malachi, the whole book's basically about this, this, this issue. The Israelites were not paying their tithe, and God says, here's how God says it, you are robbing me. If everyone in this church tithed consistently, we could do any dream we come up with. But there's several things I would love to do that we can't do because there's people that rob God. Inside our auditorium, inside D, we have offering boxes. We don't pass the plate. We have offering boxes because we don't think everyone else should see what, each week what you give because we know we all sit in the same seats every week. <laughs> and as those plates come around, the, 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 the statistics of people who never give to the kingdom is, is baffling to me. We will claim Jesus, and yet we rob him daily. Now, if you're a non-believer, you're someone who doesn't follow Christ, you're someone who's just kind of checking church out and you just kind of happen to be here today, don't put any money in the boxes. You don't owe anything. But if this is the place where you get fed, where your kids get loved, where you have community, and you're not giving generously of what God's giving you, which, by the way, is his anyway, then that car you drove here today is a stolen vehicle. Those clothes that you put on today are stolen clothes. We rob God all the time, don't we? Whenever we put something in our hearts in front of him, we steal from God. It's a very convicting verse. So we don't want to rob each other and we don't want to rob God. Look at verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. That word corrupting is where I got the title of my sermon today. It literally means rotting. Let no rotting talk come out of your mouth but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. This is a verse that all of us break very often, that all of us struggle with. How many times have you talked about someone not in the room at the time and it kind of made you look a little better? Or you kind of put someone else down in their situations? We all struggle with this, don't we? Don't we? We all struggle with this. Corrupting words. Some of you grew up in homes where words were rotting. Some of you learned how to talk with rotting tones. Well, just shut up. You're just being stupid. You never do anything right, and it just rots. Some of you have friends that have rotting words. You see them, you had not seen them in a while. They come up to you in the foyer. We say some dumb things to each other. Wow, I hadn't seen you in a while. You put some pounds on this winter. Just rotting. But what about those people who have, as the Bible calls them, words that are vessels of silver and gold? You love to see them, don't you? 
They always encourage you. How are you doing? It's so good to see you. Their words just encourage you every time you see them. Those are the people you want to be around. Why wouldn't we want to be those people? Writing words usually come from a bitter heart. Bitter heart happens because life hasn't turned out the way you want it to turn out, and you're not in control, and you don't like it. I got news for you. If you're a Christian, it means God's in charge, and you're not. That's the definition of being a Christian. Welcome to Christianity. There's a lot of things in my life I would have changed. I would have made myself six foot four. That's why I like the video, because I'm tall on it. <laughs> Rotting words. So here's some questions you can ask. Should I say something? Is it wholesome? Will it build people up? Will it benefit those around me? And would my Savior say it? Is it wholesome? Will it build up people around me? Should I say it? Would my Savior say it? Look at verse 30. This is the application of this sermon right here. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Very unique verse. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Meaning this, when you're a bitter person, you grieve God. When you're an unforgiving person, you grieve God. When you're an angry person, you, forg- you grieve God. That word grieve literally means pain. Have you ever thought, most Christians don't ever think about this, your sin causes God's heart to hurt. And if you don't believe it and you're a parent, then think about parenting. Your child does something that's just grievous and your heart just aches because you want them to live better than that. You want them to get the blessings of God. You want them to understand what's right and what's wrong. You want them to be a kind, tender-hearted person and your heart just rips apart. How much more so God who knows not just what the child did, but every thought, every motivation, every lack of motivation, every false agenda, every time we're selfish and no one else around us even knows about it. The Bible says that it grieves his heart. If the Bible says this hurts God's heart, what do you think Satan's going to jump on in our lives? He loves to hurt God's heart. So if I can just get them to play tapes over and over, and throw some anger into it, and keep them from forgiving each other, then I can create a real mess in their lives. Look at the next verse. Verse 31. Let all bitterness, how much bitterness? All bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. He builds these words up in in destruction. He starts off the first word, he says, put away all bitterness. Don't play the tape over. Because when you play the tape over, it's always going to get worse. And you're going to turn to a wrathful person. There's going to be fury and there's going to be anger. It turns into anger that has to be outwardly expressed. I believe the point of anger here, you haven't crossed the line yet. But once you get past anger in this little line here, it's the point of no return. Because then it says it turns into clamor. Clamor is it can express itself in a physical form. You will go, and the next word is slander. You will, I will just destroy you to other people. You can go and punch someone in the face. It can turn physical. It can turn violent because it builds and you explode. And then he takes the word malice, which is just, it it literally means evil. It's, It's anything that my heart and your heart can come up with just to drive it in further. He says, put it all aside. I will say this, the most unhappy people in the world that I've ever met are people who will not forgive. If I were an atheist counselor, there are three things that I would believe are true regardless of what I think about the Bible or Jesus. Number one, when you sleep around before you get married to your mate, it's going to cause pain in that marriage. I believe that whether I'm a Christian or not. Number two, stay out of debt. Debt that will destroy your life. It will destroy your life whether you believe in Jesus or not. Number three, you've got to forgive people. Whether I believe in Jesus or not, I think those three things are true. Bitterness, malice, slander, clamor. They can ruin marriages and families and churches and testimonies and God is grieved. The shovel of grace is really the only way to dig these roots up. Here's the shovel. Look at verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving. Those aren't words you want to hear when you're mad at someone, is it? 
I don't want to be tenderhearted. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to be kind. Here's the catch. As God in Christ forgave you. Ugh. He knew me at my worst, and he loved me the most. How can I not forgive you? And here's the issue. But they won't, they won't ask for forgiveness. They won't repent. They won't change. They won't admit they did it wrong. It has nothing to do with you. You do what's right. See, they're going to soften before God either now or later, but they're going to soften. Justice will come. But justice isn't your job. Forgiveness is your job. The compassionate, forgiving person says, I know I'm hurt, but I know I've hurt others too. In forgiving, you realize God will change them or they'll find his justice. Aren't you glad God is not unforgiving? How can I love my enemies? Well, you were at enmity with God and he loved you. Where have you legitimized your anger? Is there bitterness in your heart that you justified? Pastor, you don't know my circumstances. See, everyone thinks their circumstances are harder than everybody else. We all have bad circumstances. We all have jacked up families, right? Amen? Amen. Some of them are sitting with me right now, right? We all hurt each other. That's why we love life groups here, because it gets messy. And you got to sit in a living room with some people, and you got to bump. You must no longer, the text says before this one, live as the Gentiles live. It's a higher calling to be like Jesus. These are expressions of the character of God, so we should be like this because he is like this. Tough words, aren't they? They're true, though. Whether I'm a Christian or not, I've seen this stuff played out time and time again in my life and the life around, around me of those I care about. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this tough but true word from Paul. And Father, I pray that we'd be men and women who forgive Men and women who are tender-hearted and loving. Men and women of compassion because you're a God of compassion. Father, I pray that we would let things go and trust you with it. Because ultimately we can't control any circumstances anyway. And ultimately you're going to fix all of them. All the circumstances. Lord, I pray that we'd be a people who remind ourselves daily of the darkness of our own hearts and how you've forgiven us and how you've been tender and how you've been kind and how you've been patient and that you give us the strength and the courage and the desire to emulate you, our Father, as your child. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray.